Thanks for coming. I'm Chris Heilman from Mozilla. I flew in from England yesterday with lots of screaming kids on their way to Disney World. And uh, I, I ended up here basically by, uh, by pestering the Sencha people after I saw that CentraCom was announced. I'm like, that's a great location for a conference. Do you need a speaker? And then they said, yeah, yeah, you can have the slot that our CEO was supposed to give. And please talk, to about, talk about really cool new things on the web that are amazing and fascinating. And I'm not going to do that because I don't want to be sued. Because uh, a crazy redhead showing technology that of the future that might be dangerous is a copyright infringement. And we are in a hotel that is owned by Disney, so I don't want that to happen to me. And furthermore, I don't like these kind of talks. I don't like the talks that basically go on like, oh, look, in the bright future, this is happening. Look, I have this nightly build of my browser that I compiled from source and I put on these 15 different flags to show you a technology that might be able in the future to use. That doesn't make any sense to you. You cannot go home back to your boss and all your clients and say like, well, go to about flags and turn these five flags on and then my website is going to work. This is not how innovation is happening. This is how browser makers are getting excited about things that they have that the competition doesn't have. And I find it rather arrogant that we as developers keep looking into the future and hoping that things will come rather than understand that the web has always been about web developers doing crazy things and making them work and then standardizing them afterwards. When I started as a web developer about 16 years ago, the browser makers were impossible to reach. The W3C was this ivory tower in the corner that I couldn't get up to and they wouldn't listen to me if I screamed. And nowadays all of these things are open and we have the power to actually get these things started. And we only can make this by using them. And we cannot use them if it needs a certain nightly build of a browser which we can't ship to out of all of our users because they don't have AOL CDs any longer. It's also a kind of escapism. It's like okay, I would love to use these things, but I'm going back to my job and I'm frustrated right now. And I don't see why we're trying to have a future that might come when the current situation is absolutely awesome. I've never been happy as a web developer with the stuff that we can do. But we always try to complain about the things that we might be able to do. And a lot of them are very restrictive that we don't need to do on the web at all. So a lot of the CSS4, CSS3 proposals are great for print layouts that we now finally can put on the web. After fighting with developers and designers for 20 years that print layout should not be on the web. But a web layout should be much more flexible than that. So we're trying to go back in, into the world that we had before. And it's dangerous. Uh, to me, all these demos and things are dangerous when it comes to my normal communication. My normal communication right now is with business people because I work on Firefox OS, I work on HTML5, and I go to all these companies and say, HTML5 is awesome, please, please use it. And they don't want to hear that something is not quite baked yet. They don't want to hear that something is different from browser to browser. They've got two main things that actually are their problems. When I talk about HTML5, I talk about HTML5, the core, but all the other technologies as well. This is a, an attempt of a diagram to show what all the different open standards are about right now on the web. And in the press, this is called HTML5. That's only a small part of it. Some of that is discarded already. Some of that will never be used. But it's, it's a massive confusion for people because HTML5 has become this advertising term. And people are like, oh, yeah, that means iPads, right? Or this means like you have to use this browser and that will never happen. And it's mostly for people talking about mobile. We have this hypnophone that actually gets us, stops us from communicating with each other so we can go online and complain that we don't have any friends while we're standing next to somebody else looking at our phone instead of having a communication. But it's not fully that. When I see what you can do with Sencha and other places on the desktop, HTML5 is awesome on the desktop, but most people will only talk about it in a mobile uh, concern. And there they have two things that they're scared about. The first one is that a lot of developers come originally from a, uh, uh, from a platform that is a closed mobile platform. And then out of a sudden, Steve Jobs goes on stage and basically says, hey, we have a smartphone here. The smartphone is web-based. You have the best browser on this planet, Safari, that's what he said. It's debatable, but that's what he said. And he said, no SDK required. 
HTML5 is everything. Flash is evil. If you, if you use it, you get hives or people throw things at you and everything will be fine. And then two months later, out of a sudden, it's like, yeah, HTML5 is fine. But actually, if you want to be in our marketplace, then please write it in uh, Objective-C or what other language other platforms come up with, like Java or Pascal or whatever people want. So we had this promise. And for other people, it was a threat. Out of a sudden, their whole market collapsed. They're like, hey, we built things on like uh, Blackberries and things in closed environments, out of a sudden these unwashed hippies from the web want to go in our market and do things there as well. And the biggest thing for them is fragmentation, the business people. And we're like, oh my God, we have to support several browsers? No, no, isn't there a government sanctioned browser that everybody has to install? Isn't the, can the, can't, the government, can't the company tell people what to use? For us, the web was always fragmentation. I never knew what end users had. I never knew what resolution they had, what state of drunkenness they're in, what country they're in. I always had to write very flexible code for the web. And for me, fragmentation is choice and not fragmentation. But for a lot of people in business, that's a big thing. Another thing, of course, is security. So uh, that was actually uh, the Sun newspaper, I think, in England. So this is what a hacker looks like. So make sure your applications, <laughs> make sure your applications are proven against a crowbar, and <laughs> whatever this is doing there. But security is a big issue to people. And when we tell people continuously that the coolest, newest things that we get excited about are beta, alpha, maybe not ready, will change in the future, security not concerned, but security aware people say like, okay, this will never work. We go back to the uh, closed platforms that tell us that everything works there because developers have to pay to code. That means it's secure, right? The mobile web is this thing that got thrown onto us out of a sudden. So native developers look at it and say like, whoa, everybody wants to go to a mobile web. We got to learn this HTML5 thing. And web developers go on it and say like, well, we have to do this somehow, but out of a sudden we don't have access to the hardware. We don't, we're not playing on, a, on the same playing field as native apps do. So who's owning it and who's not is a big, big concern right now. And what do we do? We wait. We stand there and say like, okay, well, there's a standard in the making and let's wait if Google says it's finally, finally ready to be used. Let's wait till Microsoft says it's in a press release that it's ready for use now. That's not how the web worked and never worked. We did layouts with tables, which was a terrible, brutal hack, but it still works. And it worked back then. It gave us the interfaces that we needed at that time. We need you to actually uh, pester browsers, pester makers of standards, to make these things usable for us right now, rather than making it the pie in the sky thing that may, might come in the future. And abstracting it away into libraries is one way of doing it right now. But if the libraries don't update and still use old technology, then we're actually not helping the web either. So the web is really what you make it. So complaining that things would be lovely if we could use them, if you don't use them, they're not going to get into browsers. We need you to test these things for us and tell us what's broken. We cannot assume what you need these things for. I might use WebSockets for one thing, somebody else does it for something completely different. So we need people to implement them and then we can make the web what it's supposed to be. Not like, okay, now it's ready and now go. The, ama the amount of people with Firefox or S right now that tell me they can't start developing until they have a phone in their hand hurts me. I love being a web developer because it didn't matter what kind of hardware I had. I had like really horrible old PCs and I still wrote my JavaScript, my CSS and my HTML. And I didn't have to go to a course. I didn't have to go have a, a certain license to actually do it. I just wrote things with it. And this is what you can do as well. So. Let me tell you a quick thing about, uh, about this font that I found. I know nothing about typography. I, I make people scream when I do layouts. But this font I really, really liked. It's called Bell Centennial, and it looks like crap. <laughs> it is absolutely awful. It's like this E thing there and these little things. What the hell is going on there? Why would anybody who's, uh, who's inclined to be to beautiful things, a designer, come up with this kind of font? And it's, it's not like uh, Comic Sans, it's not really that terrible, but it's a weird, weird font. So what are these missing bits? What's going on there? Why is that out of a sudden a Bezier curve here rather than just a straight down curve? And what are these, these little things in there? Well, the story behind that font is that it actually was made for telephone books. Now, telephone books means you have to print lots of them really cheaply on really crap paper. So we needed a font that can be readable on that paper. 
So when you actually use that font in a uh, in a in a in a book in a uh, in a phone book, all these little bits are actually ink uh, uh, traps. So the ink bleeds out into those traps and makes that font readable. Much like a tattoo of a, a of a barcode is absolutely pointless because in two years' time it's a gray blotch. So paper works the same as skin as it changes and gets ripped and these kind of things. So when you actually see it in the phone book, this font this, uh, this uh, font is beautiful and it's readable and it works and it was that extra bit that we did not know when we lo looked at the font the first time why does it look that way because it was built for a certain purpose and this is how we should approach technology the same way as well we shouldn't complain that that uh, that app cache is broken we shouldn't complain that we cannot do 3d rotations in internet explorer 6 we should find out when it's really necessary to apply these things and then fix them there and go back to browser makers and say like here's our problem here's what we need to do I did a, a I organized an event in London uh, called scripting enabled where I was uh, I'm very uh, I'm very much in concern uh, concerned about accessibility and making things available for people worldwide independent of their abilities so accessibility is always like how do I comply with the law not like how do I make it work with somebody with a certain disability and when it comes to understanding what's going on there, we don't have the information. So I had a whole day of friends of mine with different disabilities go on stage and show where they get stuck when they use the web. And then I had a hack day after that uh, where developers took the information from that, built prototypes around these issues and sent these to the companies that blocked out people with certain disabilities. So that's the step that I want you to think about. What is the application? Where are the barriers that we have right now? Or do we just want to have something because we want to have it? A lot of new technology goes into browsers because it's shiny, not because it's really needed. And other things are needed but don't get revisited anymore because they're a year old and nobody is, it doesn't make headlines when I say I fixed this kind of thing. So let's talk about CSS. CSS is amazing. It's as a developer, uh, as a programmer, I looked at it for the first time and I'm like, oh my God, who came up with that syntax? That's just nuts. Like, important with an exclamation mark in front of it, to me, means not important, instant, other than important, and these kind of things. But we can do amazing things with CSS in the browser right now. No, we cannot do it in old Internet Explorer 6, but that doesn't matter. Because if CSS are nice to have things in a lot of cases, if in Internet Explorer it's basically a long page with paragraphs and headlines, and it becomes a, a, becomes a tab layout in a, in a new browser, great. Don't give people on old Internet Explorer beautiful interfaces. They just get confused when you do that because they're not used to that. <laughs> Transforms. Transforms on CSS. Stop using, uh, stop using things like positioning. Transforms allows you to do, for example, a skew here, which I never understood why we would have skew, but you can turn it around. You can do a rotate. You can actually rotate it by degrees or by radians. You can uh, turn it, rotate it 180 degrees to turn it around. You can scale it to different sizes. This is the normal font size. This is four times the size. And all of these things are possible with one line of CSS. And it works across browsers now. It uses, uh, sadly enough, in Chrome still a prefix, which I just bitched at the, uh, uh, to, the, to, the app, uh, to the Google person about. So that's going away as well. But transform allows you to actually position everything in, on the screen and it's running on the GPU. It's not on the main processor. So for mobile devices, low-end mobile devices, the best thing you can do, stop using top and left and absolute positioning because that just means you're hurting the computer. Same with 3D transforms because, of course, 3D is much more important. So you have a perspective here of like 5,000 uh, uh, pixels or you can actually do 200 to make it really big. And then you can rotate it into different axes. So you say like 20, or you say rot rotate uh, Y to turn it in this one. Again, you can scale it, but now it's, it scales in 3D space, so you actually have to change the rotations as well. That works. And it's sometimes a beautiful thing to do. Nothing you really need, but you have to understand that it's there. And there's a hack on, uh, on iOS to do a 3D transform every time you do a transform. Not necessarily the best idea. It's just something that's broken in iOS right now that might hurt us in the future. But 3D transforms are a great opportunity to make an interface really deep and, uh, and well, engaging. Transitions, like, okay, how do I make this fade from one to another? This is how you do. Transition background, transition one second. I roll over this, I got my transition to white. I changed the color here to blue, I got my transition to blue. 
I change it to like two seconds, it, tra uh, it transitions slower. I, to, uh, I say wait half a second before you actually transition it, so it waits half a second and then transitions it. You don't need a JavaScript library for that, this is in the browser. And if you do with a JavaScript library, you do with a timeout and you're hurting the battery life of my mobile phone again. These things are nice things to have, so just use them in a technology that it was built for. Everything that you put in CSS as a browser maker, we can optimize for you. Everything you write in JavaScript with your own animations, we can't. It's up to you to optimize it. So don't come to us and say it's slow because you wrote that animation yourself. You have to find out how to make it faster. Talking of which, animations are basically transitions that are much more defined and you can actually say different states. So I can scale this up to four here or to seven to make it like really huge, which doesn't, yay, there you go. And I can animate it infinite or I can animate it faster. I can, oops, I can go alternate, I can just go to one direction, so it goes back and forth, these kind of things. This is all very simple things. And the best thing for me as a developer, I don't need to do this. The person that makes the beautiful things in CSS, that defines the fonts, the colors, the margins, the, the, that knows about leading and kerning and these kind of things, they also do the animations. Because I don't want to do them, because they would look awful if I did them. So we keep all these things in one space, and this is ready for us. Please use CSS and don't write things in JavaScript. Flexbox is something we needed for years and years. Flexbox was not in Firefox because we're still wondering what to do with it. Then Sencha came out with Fastbook, which basically was the proof of concept that HTML5 can be as fast as the Facebook native app on iOS. So we said, okay, here is a final prototype that really needs Flexbox. Flexbox. Box. So we actually put it in there. What does Flexbox mean? I have these three elements in there and I can actually put them to the start of the thing. I can put them to the end of the thing. I can put it in the middle. I think it's center. I put it in the middle. I can do it to the top of the main controller, to the bottom of it, or if I don't do it anything, they stretches it automatically. So I have full layout control over this. Well, this is not disco enough because right now it basically is still, we still have the width of the thing either as a uh, as the width of the content, or how do I get three elements into a main element? I have to calculate 100% divided by three. That's a lot of hard math. We don't want to do that. So what we do is in this, we do a Modsbox Flex or the other one as well. And then out of a sudden, these elements take up the whole space. I don't have to do any calculations anymore. I can put borders on them. I can put margins on them. I can put paddings on them without having to do any calculating extra things. Then I can actually take one of them and say like, well, one is not what you are, you're actually three. So it actually gives me more space for one of them and makes the others automatically smaller. So your layouts, your multi-column layouts become uh, much, much easier to use. Also, it's independent of the order in the, uh, in the, uh, in the system itself. So one, two, three are HTML elements that are in after each other. So if I change that now to two here, I can move the two to the end of them. If I change it to zero, I can move it to the beginning of them. So I've got full flexible control of the layouts in the browser, and that works. And please, let's think about what kind of cool interfaces we can do that when we don't have to mess around with floating and positioning absolutely, positioning relatively. This stuff is there for us, and it's used. Canvas is cool. Canvas is this uh, uh, basically low-level painting API. The first time I saw it, I'm like, oh, I can paint in the browser, I can make things. And then I realized that they must have had some, uh, uh, some coaching by the PHP people because they have clever things like begin path and close path rather than begin path and end path or open path and close path. So you always have to look into the documentation of it. But what Canvas under the hood is, is a, uh, a pixel array. It's a pixel array that is empty that you can plot into and you can write things into, and you can use that to um, play with, with images, for example. This is a, a, a GIF, an animated GIF, uh, of the, how America was during the time, like how the, how the whole states came around. And it's far too fast. I found it on the web, and it's like, I can't follow this. And then I wondered, what do I do with an animated GIF to stop it? And there's this bookmarklet that now uses a web worker and Canvas to render the, uh, to take the GIF, go on the, on the byte level of it, get the different animation frames and put them into a canvas. And then I've got this controller down there, much like a video, and I can go forward and backward frame by frame into a GIF. The GIF was not in my control. This was a finished packaged product, but I can use now in the browser byte level access to images using canvas to actually do these kind of manipulations. And that's amazing. 
And that fact that browsers are fast enough for that is amazing as well. I was happy in the past when I made a thing spin or our marquee didn't, didn't go top left rather than that. I did this the other day, irregular shape rollovers is something we always wanted and there were SVG shapes where possible and there's probably a CSS filter now as well. But the very, it's a very simple way of doing it. Every single pixel in a canvas is available to you to read the color of it. And you get the color back as three values, RGB and opacity. If the opacity is zero, it means it's actually a, a transparent pixel. So what I do here is I have PNGs or GIFs that actually have a, an alpha channel. And when I roll over them, I see which part I'm in. So the whole code for that functionality is actually here. So you can see this working on, uh, on GitHub as well. And if I look at the code and I look at the shape rollover, this is the whole JavaScript, nothing else, no library, nothing. As we have full access to it, we copy the image into the, into the canvas, and this is how I find out what pixel I'm on at the moment. And if that pixel is transparent, then I'm on a transparent part of the image, which means I put a class of over on the parent element, and if, I re uh, if I'm not on one of them, I remove the class of over. That's how I do the red background things that are happening, uh, the green background that is happening here. So we don't need to wait for technology if we just understand that some of the technologies we have can be used for things we did not think were actually possible. Image masking, the same thing. SVG masks have been around for a while. Firefox was the first to support them. Other browsers are still waiting for, I don't know, in, uh, something a sign from God or something till they do it. But same thing here. I've got these PNGs down there that are the blurry circle and the, uh, and the star and the image. And with, uh, with a slight JavaScript, that's not even a loop, that just basically overlays those two images with compositing onto each other, onto a canvas that is off screen, and then puts it back as the data source of the image, I can make image masking. Look at these technologies and come from a different world. Don't look at the API that is maybe annoying, but think about what can I do with this that I always wanted to do, and you will find that in a lot of cases there's, uh, there's ways of doing it. WebRTC is the big future thing right now, which basically is a lot of it is just uh, being used for get user media, which means getting audio input or video input into the browser. But it's actually more than that. There's also a data channel on WebRTC, which would allow us to do peer-to-peer -peer connections of computers. Imagine two users going to your website, logging in, and then you make them connect to each other and they don't come back to your server and kill your traffic. You can actually scale to infinity with that kind of stuff. It's a bit like BitTorrent works, or other peer-to-peer -peer systems work that in the browser right now. One of the demos is uh, face to gif which is actually on the Mozilla hacks right now, explained how he did it. Horia Dragomir did this. So this is what it looks like. I basically say I give access to the camera, I allow it camera access. I, I did this this morning here actually in the room downstairs. Um, I basically record a, uh, a uh, it says now rotate uh, make.gif. So I rotate what's going, uh, I record what's going on. I finish, it computes it, so under the hood it generates a GIF again. And when I now scroll down there, this is the animated GIF that comes from my video. In the browser, without a plugin, without any extras that I needed to do. So I can generate things in the browser nowadays that was never possible before. In general, I think we need tooling. Whatever panel I'm on, whatever discussion group I'm on, and whatever talk I see, ends up with like, yeah, this is all cool, but I don't have time to look through all these things. I don't have time to tinker with it. I want a tool to do it for me. And I'm happy that we have Sencha. I'm happy that Adobe is being uh, in the HTML space as well right now, because if anybody proved the last 40 years that they make tools that people need, not necessarily want, but need, it's Adobe. And because Photoshop is basically the thing to make images with. There's no way around it. And we need tools that are basically uh, under the hood or openly supporting standards, like a Phillips screwdriver. We have Phillips screwdrivers. They're great. Like, you can actually make screws, put screws in and put screws out of that. But actually, there's a standard for it. Because the problem was, like, every piece of hardware or every piece of furniture came with a different screw. And people were like, that's not possible any longer. I want to have one screwdriver to do everything with. And what we use, though, is other things, like we use like knives, or we use whatever we find to actually loosen screws, or power tools like this one. I don't want to use it by hand, I want to have some... Rah! And then this happens. And this is exactly what happens with the web right now. When people use their own, uh, uh, their own abstraction layers instead of going to the standards, like... When people keep telling me, like, why isn't SAS built into Firefox? And you're like, because it's not a standard. 
because it's something that somebody came up with that can change every single day. You cannot rely on that thing. It has not been tested across different platforms. It's not natively in the browser. You have to, you have to do a conversion tool for that. And we do that all the time. This is this great video that I found that what to do with a screw that actually works like that. So he's very excited about having this car in the back of it that actually is his friend or something. I don't know. Uh, American TV is awesome. So basically he's like, he's like, okay, this screw is bad. So first thing, take a smaller bit and then do it by hand because you're manly enough to do that. Or use a rubber band and put that into it and then you can take the screw out. Or basically do, use a massive drill and actually just kill the screw and we go from there. And that's the kind of approach that I keep seeing by people that saying like, oh, JavaScript is not good enough, we have to make our own language. Or uh, we have to have a, a pre-compiler before things work. And it's just not that necessary. We don't need more power tools. We need the tools that we have to work. And we need you to actually use those tools to make it work. I love that he's a sponsor and he's like, my car helped me with this. Because... <laughs> Getting new tools into people is hard. I mean, if somebody likes SAS and we tell less is better, that's going to be like a, a thread of like 500, uh, 500 posts with lots of meme pictures and uh, uh, people telling off each other for their sexual orientation and things like that. This is a rental car. This is so cool that basically the, the key is down there and everybody else just came in and scratched the key next to the steering wheel because that's where the key is supposed to be. And this is what happens with all these abstraction layers as well. Like, it's supposed to work like that. That's why I want to have it. Why isn't PHP like Perl? Why isn't Perl like Python? Like, yeah, because they're different things. So we found going to game companies and saying, like, hey, you should use HTML5 for games. That's the future. It's awesome. Please use HTML5. And then they pointed into a room and said, like, oh, we've got this 300 C++ developers there that we pay a lot of money. They're very happy writing C++. Shall we re-educate them on JavaScript? I don't think that's going to happen. It's going to be a mutiny and people are going to throw things because C++ and JavaScript is a bit of a different thing. So what we did in Mozilla, what we thought about uh, is what, how can we get code that is in, uh, in that level, C, C++, Java, how can we get this into the browser without using any uh, uh, Java applets? Let's not go there anymore. And we, used, uh, we started ASM.js. ASM.js is a subset of JavaScript, which basically optimizes it for, uh, uh, for memory use and for, for performance. So with ASM.js, you can turn LLVM bytecode uh, coming from C++ or C into JavaScript. So what we did here is, uh, is turn the Epic, uh, with Epic Games, we turned the, um, the Unreal 3D engine within uh, four days using mscript into JavaScript. So this is now running in the browser as a, a 3D engine that was written in C and, uh, and actually converted into JavaScript. So there's no flash needed, there's no silverlight needed. You can turn your C++ code into browser-enabled code. It's completely unreadable. It's terrible code. That's why web developers, when they look at it, like, oh, what is that? It's not written by hand. It's not meant for humans. It's written by computers for computers. And I love that because I don't want to re-educate C++ people. That's going to be quite a job. And we shouldn't have to. If you're happy to write C++, we can write conversions to get into it. And this one is in Firefox now, in the newest one. And Chrome uh, also uh, praised it at Google I.O., so hopefully there's something happening there as well. But I love the idea of putting any code onto the web rather than having to re-educate people because you, you cannot re-educate people. It's a lot of work. So other things that are happening if you peek behind uh, and you try to find things. I was not uh, going to talk about it much, but I have to because it's awesome. Uh, Firefox OS is an operating system that Firefox uh, or Mozilla released. And it is targeted at the people that don't have iOS, that don't have Android. So we're not competing with iOS and Android. We're bringing the mobile web to people that don't have mobile web right now. So it's targeted at new emerging markets or low-income markets. And the first markets we released it, it's already live. You can buy a Firefox phone in, uh, in Spain for 70 euro with already 30 euro uh, uh, voucher for apps on it. So this is a, a con no contract phone. So you can go into the shop, pay 70 euro, give this phone to your kid, here play some games, lots of games on the marketplace. Uh, and you don't have to worry that tomorrow your credit card had like $6,000 on it because they bought whatever, like uh, tractors and things from each other or, or played some game that you didn't want to. And it's actually very affordable hardware. 
it's no credit card needed. That was a big barrier. I mean, like, okay, Android is free, but without a credit card, you can't, you cannot pay anything on the uh, on the Play Store. You still need to put your information in before you go there. It's web technologies through and through. Nothing in Firefox OS is uh, Java or C++ or Cocoa or whatever other language you need to do. The operating system itself is uh, a Linux core, which actually then has JavaScript APIs on top that talk to the Firefox browser engine. All the apps are written in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Anything you have on the web already as HTML5 can be a Firefox OS app just by writing a manifest file and pointing the Firefox OS device to it. You can install from the web. You don't have to install through the marketplace. You can run an install button with a few lines of code as well. And it's got full hardware access because that was my big bugbear that in HTML I could not access the camera. I could not access the accelerometer. I have to go through something like Cordova. I have to package it up somehow or with the Sencha stuff that we saw today, I have to run it inside another app to get these kind of access. We've got 19 mobile partners in, uh, in 12 countries and five hardware partners, including Foxconn, who want to build tablets with us. So we've got LG, we've got Alcatel, we've got Sony. And as I said, in Poland and Spain, these phones are already available. For developers, you can buy these on the web to actually start playing with them. But you don't need them because there's an emulator in the browser that you can play with. So this one was the main thing that we wanted to do. We realized the web is mobile now and there's no open player there. So we needed to get something out to people. And when I say full hardware access, this is it. Vibration API, mouse lock, battery status, web FM for radio, ambient light sensor, how much light is outside your phone to give a dark interface or a light interface. And all of these things are not Firefox only. These are open standard proposals that other browsers can implement as well. Opera had implemented, for example, the battery status API. Geolocation is, is implemented in every browser by now. And all of these things I want to see in every platform out there. I want a secure way of accessing the hardware rather than being told only native apps can do that. So there is a wiki page for that where you can see the status of all of the implementations and you can actually start playing with them as well. Web activities are another interesting point because uh, a lot of times we cannot give you access from any web app on the web, for example, to the address book, because we don't know your server. We don't know if your server has been hacked and the data goes somewhere where you don't want it to go, like NSA or China. And for that, we needed to find a way to actually get people, give people access to the hardware without the app having to be signed for it, because there's nothing more annoying than going to a, a, an app store Installing an app and then saying like, do you want to allow it to do this? Do you want it to do it allow to do this? This, this. We all just go through, yes, 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 I want to play that game. It's the same lie as like, yeah, I read the terms and conditions, of course. I didn't just go through it and like, yeah, I want to play this right now. So web activities uh, is much like what we heard uh, in, it's not intentions, whatever it was called, the central thing right now. If you have an app that you take pictures with, that you love and you understand and you installed and you're happy with, why should I make a web interface to take pictures with in my app? So what a web activity does is say like, get, uh, I, uh, I want a photo or I want an image. So you say the pick activity, you call this in a JavaScript call, and the phone will then go and say, okay, this app wants an image. Do you want to go to your images folder, do you want to go to your wallpapers folder, or do you want to take a picture? The user takes the picture, the picture comes back as a file blob into your applications. So instead of authenticating your app to access the camera, you just go through the app that is already authenticated and people are happy with. And I love this. We should, have to, we should stop trying to, um, trying to authenticate on the behalf of users. That's why Twitter gets hacked continuously. Because people just give their identity away to some other piece of software to get some automated updates or automated posts. And with web activities, there's always the step at the end that the user has to say, okay, I do this right now. Which of course can mean the UX of your, pay, uh, of your app has to change, but you have access to it without asking the user for it, without having to package it up. So there's dialing for telephone calls, and when I hang up the call, it tells me which telephone number has been called, how long the call took, these kind of things. Uh, safe bookmark, view, cost control, record, share. So we, we looked at the activities of the web and we made them an API to talk to native apps that way. And this works on Android and it works on Firefox OS. So if you've got Firefox on your Android, this, this totally works for your app there as well.
which is something that we wanted to do as well because it's not only Firefox, we work for the web. This is really cool. App discovery is a problem to a lot of people. I go to a, I, I like a band. Cool, I want to have a band, I want to know something about that band right now. I go to the Apple store, I go to the app thing, I'm like, okay, where do I find, uh, where do I find an app that has to do with that band? So I either have a promoted app that I click on, which are the 20 promoted apps, which are, which are basically making Apple a lot of money, not necessarily the developer of the app, or I have to go through the categories and find music apps, bands, punk, bad religion, and then find maybe one app to do it. Or I need to know the name of the app. That's why as app developers, you have to go to TV stations and magazines and like newspapers to make sure that people know what Vine means or what Instagram means. So why is this the thing? Software is indexable. Texts on the web are indexable. That's why the app discovery on Firefox OS does that. So this is basically you swipe to the right, uh, you swipe to the left and you type the name of a band and it finds apps that have to do with music. So YouTube for video, uh, SoundCloud for music, Wikipedia has to do with the band and I click on these and then I start listening to the song and if I like it I long click and install it. So what is being loaded here is not the app being installed, it's actually the uh, web optimized HTML version of whatever app we're showing here, Amazon or a SoundCloud or Songkick. But the search goes through, you don't have to type the Linkin Park in this case again as well. This works also with movies like Skyfall, the James Bond movie, now it gives me Flickster, IMDb, uh, Netflix, and it even works with like food and these kind of things. So we made app discovery as easy as searching the web. And why shouldn't it be? It's HTML5 apps. Shouldn't we want, shouldn't we, should we need to have that? Why should I know the name of an app to start using it if all I want to do is take pictures? I, I type in pictures, it would show me all the apps for, uh, uh, for taking pictures and I don't need to know what Instagram is. Yeah, for chicken it showed me Yelp and OpenTable here for example. Not a chicken app because not many people are breeding chickens, more people eat them. And this is also localized, so if you're in Brazil, you get the Brazil music player. If you're in Poland, you get the, you get the service that is the number one service there. And you see where this is going. If your app would be the first one in localized markets, people would install it because they find it, not because they know the name of it and you have to make an uh, appetite in these local markets. I talked about this before a bit, WebRTC Data Channel. This is a really cool demo that uh, the Chrome team has put out as well, which is called CubeSlam. And this is using WebGL and access to the camera to actually play Pong against each other and shoot the live video of the other person. So this one is one of those Chrome demos where they cram every new technology into one demo that is really exciting for a few weeks and then the press forgets about it again. But luckily enough, a lot of that is, open, uh, is out there as open source as well, so we can play with it as well. So if you take a look at that and you try it out in Chrome, it's really exciting what you can do with that. And that's using the data channels that is peer-to-peer -peer connection between two users rather than having one Chrome, uh, Chrome server in between. It's a very, uh, yeah, the demo loads a bit, loads a bit slow here. But this is what it looks like. So I have like a video and I play against each other and I, I now have the live video of somebody else. So it's basically like Skype with a gaming thing in it. And yeah, Skype and other things, I mean, I love them, I use them, but why is that necessary? That should be part of every browser. If I give it access to my camera, why can't I talk in real time to people around me? Same with music. Why can't I access music on the, uh, on the level of bytes? And with the web audio API, you can do that. One thing that is incredibly, incredibly good and um, is actually not being discussed or not being used by enough people yet is the Shadow DOM. Shadow DOM and web components. We build immensely complex interfaces, especially here at Sencha. I heard that everybody has these like massive like uh, uh, pivot tables and like massive scrolling lists and all of these things. And all of the performance problems that we have there is the DOM. We're writing to the DOM, we're reading from the DOM. And whatever, however fast the JavaScript engine will be, the DOM reading and writing was, will, is, the, is the thing that will slow us down because there's no caching involved. There's, it's tricky to make the DOM work fast. And the jQuery culture doesn't help. jQuery, when it came out, the first thing it said, like, go to the DOM, access something, change it, and go back. Go back to the DOM, change something else. So we saw the DOM as this playground, like whenever you want to do something, don't do it in a data object or on an MVC type thing, do it directly in the HTML. And that is incredibly slow and we have to find a way of doing that. 
So in essence, we reinvent browser rendering in JavaScript. So UI elements are already being rendered in the browser. When an HTML, when I, uh, I have an HTML, I have an H1 in there at a certain size. When the browser uh, creates the image, it gets into the CSS, it renders the HTML, and it gives me the size in that font and actually loads the font and does all these things for me. And then we actually make this in JavaScript on top of it, and we wonder why it's slow. So with Shadow DOM, we can actually intercept the browser's rendering. So instead of having to do a, a, a rendering on top of it and doing the performance testing of our own rendering, the browser has to paint something anyways. So why don't we get access to that? The, uh, the simplest way to explain Shadow DOM is basically a video element. I put a video element in the page and all of a sudden I got this play button and this volume control and this slider. And what is that? Is that magic? Is that flash? No, it's HTML, JavaScript, and CSS that is used by the browser internally and generated internally. So if you go to Chrome and you go to the DevTools and you, uh, you enable the show shadow DOM, you can actually inspect all these elements, what they look like. What, do, what is an input element made of? What is the borders that are around there? What is, an, what is a video element made of? And you can start initi initializing that and creating your own shadow elements that the browser will render automatically for you, which means you will have interfaces that are this snappy and you don't have to worry about the performance because it's the performance of the main browser and not of your own interface. So they break that cycle and it's actually amazing. If you look at the demos that are out there and look at what people are doing with it, and I think this is really what we need because the rendering is just becoming more and more complex and the hardware that we're using is getting faster for the high level but not for the people in the, in the world, not for everybody. People will use old computers. People will use old mobile phones. So if we find a way to make performance better by intercepting the browser, browser's rendering and changing it before it renders, that's awesome. I don't have to simulate that. Another example of that is also a request animation frame. When you do things with set timeout, when you do an animation with set timeout, you say, every 50 milliseconds, please do, do this. You hope it's every 50 milliseconds, but the browser actually does different things. So the browser already uses every 50 milliseconds to actually render a new view on a normal screen of 60 hertz here in America. So every 50 milliseconds, you just go in there and like, can you show this? Can you show this? Can you show this? And I do a lot of calculation. The browser doesn't do anything because it's busy rendering as well. So with request animation frame, instead of set timeout, you, uh, you actually wait for the browser for doing the next frame. So the browser does the calculation of the timing for you rather than you doing the 50 milliseconds and hope that works. The other good thing about uh, request animation frame is if it's in a tab that is not active, then it doesn't animate. Why should it? It's just re eating battery and eating, uh, eating processor power without the user seeing it. So if the user can't see it, nothing gets animated. And that's a very, very good idea. The other thing that I'm seeing is that browsers are becoming more and more editors. Every browser has these really cool developer tools built in that I would have loved to have when I started as a web developer. I had alert. That's all I had. And I hope that the browser did something right. And nowadays you have access to everything in the browser and uh, every browser has something different. Let's take a look at the Sencha app and what it looks like into, in, uh, in the developer tools here. So this is the HTML. I've got my CSS. But what I really like uh, is the... It was just a toy the first time we, we, we implemented it, but we got a 3D view in there as well. So you can actually see the depth of the DOM, how many DOM elements you generated, and how complex your HTML is as a 3D view. And this is getting interesting when you go to like Facebook City and you say inspect element here, and let's see what HTML Facebook generates. And then it gets rather interesting because you got like Lots and lots of layers, lots and lots of levels, lots and lots of extra things. And what the hell is going on there? So if you sometimes wonder about your rendering and, and why something takes a lot of memory, this is actually a really nice tool to do. And uh, Chrome is, is totally killing it. I mean, on, uh, when you're on Google Plus and you follow the Chrome developer tool, there's something new in the Chrome DevTools every single day. I think by now they've forgotten what they put in there and they just get really excited and they find it again and then write a blog post. Which is cool, because in the end, being a browser, why should it just be a display thing? If the display thing is also the edit thing, then we, have the, then we don't have the problem that our users see something different than we do. And it's a different way of creating with it. And I want to have a future where I can right-click right a video, cut it, edit it, and send it to my friends in the browser without having to do anything special here. 
And what does the future bring? That was the question. Like, Chris, tell people what the future is. Maybe it's kittens in 3D. This is, it, it's working well on the internet so far, so it might be the future there. But I know for a fact it's not a certain hardware. Whenever new hardware providers come out and say, like, everybody will have an iPad in the future and everything else will go away, no, that doesn't work. Sorry. People will use whatever they have and whatever they can afford and whatever they want to use. Yes, people are happy with Blackberries. And you cannot change them unless you give them a free iPad, which is not going to happen anytime soon. It's also not a single browser. When me as developers are like, why doesn't everybody use, use Chrome? Why doesn't everybody use Firefox? Because it's their choice. It's their choice to choose the browser that they want. And sometimes they have companies that give them a browser that they cannot change. And it's not up to us to tell them, like, you should be better or just leave your job or something. It's not one browser. The future of the web is you. And it's you how you actually implement these new technologies, how you play with them. You can get frustrated by them and say, like, I would never be able to do that in my job. Or you can sneak it in. Like YUI, the Yahoo library that XJS was based on and Sencha was based on, was open source because of one reason. We made it open source and two days later we asked the legal department if that's okay. It would not have happened as open source in a company like Yahoo from the very beginning. Sometimes it's better to ask for forgiveness than to ask for permission. Nobody got fired, people are successful with it, it's good. File bugs and be a pain in the lower backside. Not on Twitter, but on the bug trackers of browsers. I always love people on Twitter that say like, Firefox should do this. And I'm like, so what do you want me to do now? Go to our engineer, tell them what your problem is, not knowing what your problem is, and do the, be the translator for you. Maybe call you at home or come around for a cup of tea and you explain me what your problems are. Go where the engineers sit. I know Bugzilla is awful. I know every bug tracker is terrible, but this is where the engineers go because they're busy fixing things and they're busy developing things. They don't have time to troll Facebook or Google Plus or Twitter to find problems of people. Give us a demo, what's broken, tell us what you want to have, and then we can do something with it. Yes, there might be communication problems. It's engineers after all. We're not the most social bunch. But you can get things done there, and you don't need translators sitting in between and, and doing the stuff on your behalf. Create amazing experience based on the user needs, not more toys. We have enough demos. I, next time I'm going to see that HTML5 video that when you click on it goes into like lots and lots of little, little blocks, I'm going to scream. This is a four-year-old demo. We should have moved on by now. So show us how you use these technologies in super simple, wonderful little ways. I've got a bit of time. So uh, one thing I've done was zoom and pick, which is, uh, which is something that I just, okay, why, uh, there you go, zoom and pick. Uh, why don't we have a color picker in, uh, in the web? So what I've done here is a, little, uh, is a little tool that allows me to create, to get colors from an image. So I can actually go through my image calendar, uh, images here, um, let's see, Dropbox, image bucket, something that is not offensive. Uh, there we go, let's take the coffee kitten. I drag it into the browser, it loads the image, I scroll over it, I get the colors, I click the colors, I collect my colors here, I press get code, and I get a CSS file generated with these images. On GitHub, 50 lines of JavaScript. No need for a library, no need for anything else. Canvas can read every single pixel in the image. Why can't I generate some CSS from that? I learned that a lot of the stuff that I, that I showed, like the CSS 3D as well, the CSS 3D tester, uh, no. When I want to learn something, I actually start writing a tool for myself. So this is the CSS 3D tester here, which is on GitHub and probably linked to the other one. No, it isn't. I'm bad at that. So this is how I explain to myself what 3D, 3D transformations are about. I, 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 lo I lo looked it up and then I started writing a tool to do it for me. So I can rotate this here automatically. I can turn off the preserve 3D and turn it on. I understand what the different sections are, what the coordinate shifting is about, what rotation is about. And then I have my CSS here that I can copy and paste, or I can click create full page, and I start doing that. So whenever I did CSS 3D transformations for some project, 
I started with that thing rather than starting from writing my lines of code. Visual learning is a very, very important thing. And I think we should build more tools for that. And always bet on the web because it worked for me. I would be, I'm from Germany. Without the right licenses and stuff, I wouldn't get a job. I would be homeless in Germany probably. I've never been to university. I'm a guest lecturer at five different universities now because I was interested in the web. I taught myself with the web and I shared everything that I do for free on the web. That is a thing that not all of you have to do, but it's a cool thing to do. Seeing that a book that you give out or an article that you've written, seeing it in Chinese two days later, because somebody translated it for you, hopefully, or whatever they wrote in there, is a great thing. And that's all I have time for. So thanks very much. And please take the survey. Thanks.